so much for the invitation. Uh, congratulations to Hitachi on the 100th anniversary. Thank you, Mr. Ode. Uh, and thank you, Alan, uh, a friend for many years. And uh, I, am, I have been an admirer of uh, AAAS for decades. And it's quite an honor to be uh, asked to speak here in this, uh, in this gathering. And I'm looking for, there we go, looking for the keyboard. Uh, anytime you want me to come back and talk about doping, I got some great stuff on that that's new. That I'm, uh, I was just at the U.S., uh, at the International Olympic Committee in Lausanne in a, week, a bit over a week ago, uh, talking about some new issues, learning about some new issues. Now, uh, the Hastings Center is a small, feisty, nimble and poor research institute <laughs> devoted to the study of uh, ethics in health, medicine, and the life sciences. Um, one of the co-founders of the Hastings Center, Dan Callahan, is actually in the audience this afternoon. And uh, please do seek him out uh, uh, during the reception. Uh, when I first came to the Hastings Center, I learned uh, a very important rule, kind of maxim. Good ethics begins with good facts. It doesn't end there. You still have to do the hard work of conceptual and ethical analysis. But if you don't have your facts straight, you are probably not going to have much useful to say. It might be interesting, but it's unlikely to be useful. So uh, we did, in fact, create a project as funded by the Sloan Foundation. Uh, one slight edit to what Alan said. We are not doing it in partnership with anyone else. Sloan funded three projects, us, Woodrow Wilson, and Jace, and the Venner Institute. We, we, we talk to one another, but it's completely independent. And I will be saying things that probably Craig Venner won't be thrilled that I'm going to be saying, but you, you'll decide for yourself. So uh, what do people think synthetic biology is? The Royal Society uh, focus on about redesigning life and focus on the involvement of engineers. Uh, look at the ETC group, which is a kind of critic of technology, but they say very much the same thing. It's about the redesign of existing biological systems to perform specific tasks. One more, the European Commission, again, uh, it will, synthetic biology will enable the design of biological systems, which they interestingly put in scare quotes, uh, in a rational and systematic way. So there's some agreement. But the first thing we learn, uh, oh, and I should mention some of the applications that have been proposed. Uh, one could imagine creating cells, they could be yeast or bacteria or algae that produce biofuels. Uh, this actually, uh, this is in fact an active area of research in SynBio. Uh, some have suggested creating organisms, say, re uh, redesigning the pseudomonas to degrade a pesticide. What if we had a redesigned microbe that when all the oil began to uh, emerge from the busted BP well in the Gulf of Mexico, that we could have injected into the oil spill and it would have just gobbled it up and turned it into harmless hydrocarbons. also been used to create and potentially to deliver drugs. Uh, I will say a bit more about the artemisinin work. Artemisinin is a crucial anti-malarial drug. Right now, the only source of artemisinin is from the bark of a particular tree found primarily in the developing world. It's expensive to obtain and it's in limited supply. When we began our investigation, we created an interdisciplinary research group which included um, a variety of people. We're a very interdisciplinary organization, but uh, it included several prominent scientists. So much of what I will tell you now, we've learned from the scientists involved in our work. And it turns out that synthetic biology, rather than having a kind of distinct unity, it's a bit of a, a part of it is a mindset, and part of it is a very successful marketing term for really four, at least four quite distinct lines of work. Advanced genetic engineering, DNA-based device construction, the project to create a minimal genome, and the project to create protocells. A little bit more about each of them. So this is the work of Jake Kiesling and his colleagues in California. 
They have done, you could call it genetic engineering on steroids, I suppose, to stay with the drugs and sports metaphor. Uh, they, have, uh, they, have, uh, they have reconfigured entire pathways so that they've done it in both E. coli and in yeast uh, to create uh, so that you could put in relatively simple sugars and get out artemisinic acid, which with three additional chemical steps that are more conventionally performed, you can produce artemisinin and you can treat malaria. Their goal is to reduce the cost of an artemisinin treatment from $2.40 current cost to a quarter. and to produce as much artemisinin as the world desires. Uh, this is the most advanced, okay, so there's a bit of paradox here. This is the one closest to application. They're really making this stuff now. Um, it's not commercially scaled up yet, I believe, but I think it's close. On the other hand, it is technologically, in a way, the least sophisticated. Kiesling acknowledges they had a lot of dumb luck. Well, not dumb, they had a lot of luck in their pursuit of this pathway to create artemisinic acid. Uh, the major stream number two is DNA-based device construction. This is, in, this is uh, well, some of them, they're all going to contest for most radical. This strikes me as, in terms of the way one thinks about biology, the most radical. Here, imagine the mindset uh, and methods of electronics engineers but applied to biological systems. So the goal here of the BioBricks movement, and there is a BioBricks Foundation, uh, is to encourage the creation of standardized biological parts. Think about transistors, resistors. Uh, Mr. Ode could tell, say many more of the parts that go into electronics devices than I can, capacitors, et cetera, uh, that, you could, that they would be standardized that you could put them together, sort of any configuration you wished, and that, and that the performance of that system would be predictable in advance. That's the, that's the vision. Uh, they're a long way from achieving the vision. It turns out that it's not easy to standardize these biological parts. Uh, it turns out they don't necessarily fit together as neatly as one would hope. I've referred to this as the Legoization of biology. Uh, and it turns out that biological systems have this annoying habit of not behaving in ways that you intend. Uh, you get various kinds of feedback loops and various kinds of system, si you, get, you get system effects at different levels. But this is, an, this is a remarkably uh, visionary project. Uh, it, at a one level, it's, uh, it's extremely successful. These are the sponsors of the, uh, the iGEM competition. Every year, college students get together, even some high school students, and compete to create new bio bricks and put them together in intriguing ways. That, by the way, is on the web. Uh, the, the bio bricks movement has an open source vision compatible with the open source software movement. So the idea is that these parts will be available to anyone and everyone. Um, uh, Drew Endy, who is one of the leaders of the movement, has this, said this about life. If you consider nature to be a machine, you can see that it is not perfect and that it can be revised and improved. And the mission is to do exactly that. So there's a third stream. Uh, this is the, the idea of creating a minimal cell. Uh, Craig Venner and his uh, colleagues have been the, uh, certainly the most, gotten the most headlines for this work. Uh, they've tried to create an organism with a simplified genome, and then more recently, the last article in Science Express. Do you happen to know who publishes that <laughs> journal? Uh, he announced a, what he called a sense synthetic cell. Uh, the vision there is that one would be able to create a kind of minimal chassis and the, the uh, analog with, with uh, vehicle production is, is intended. I mean, the idea is that you create a single chassis on which you could make a small pickup truck, a uh, sedan, a convertible, a station wagon, a small, you know, a small SUV or something, uh, that you'd have a chassis that you could then stick other parts in and Maybe it's the parts that the BioBricks movement is creating. 
and then you could have a system that would basically do whatever it is you wanted it to do. George, Craig Venner and George Church are leaders in this movement. Now, uh, I must say a word about this notion of a synthetic cell. Um, certainly what uh, Vetter and his team did was a scientific tour de force of brute force biology. They spent tens of millions of dollars, made a single organism, which does replicate, um, by taking a known genome of a, ver of a variant of mycoplasma and um, tweaking it and then putting it in a closely related but not identical uh, species, uh, species of microplasma. Um, so, right. so, first of all, he did not synthesize a genome. I mean, the genome was an existing genome that they tweaked. But what they did was they got gene sequence companies to spit out the sequence, and then they used biological systems, I believe, yeast, to actually stitch it together into ever larger and larger bits. Then they enucleated, they took the genetic material out of uh, a closely related microbe, stuck this in, and eventually got it to work. So his view, his argument is that by doing that, they've created a synthetic cell because the genome controls the cell. Well, that's a plausible view, but it's not the only plausible view. It's also possible to see cells as complex organisms in and of themselves. And one way to say it is that the cell adopted the new genome. Another way is to say that, well, they achieved a modus vivendi, literally, a way to live together. Uh, uh, if the genome was just lying there on its own, it was not about to create a cell around it. You needed the cell, the, the entire environment of the cell in order to get a, a viable, uh, even a very simple microbe. So, Major Stream 4 is the protocell. This, again, can claim the title of most radical because here uh, the vision is actually not even using standard biology. So, uh, maybe silicon-based life forms. I mean, other than Star Trek, I don't know that I've heard much about silicon-based star uh, life forms. And when I studied organic chemistry, there had to be carbon involved. So I don't know whether we would consider this organic chemistry or not. Maybe we have an inorganic chemistry of life. It's possible. Ed Regis, who's written about the proto-sub movement, says this, that the goal is to create a new form of life, a genuinely new living entity, one not based on biology, not made out of the customary biological ingredients. No DNA, no conventional biomolecules, no cell membrane of the early ordinary type, no nucleus, no mitochondria, no endoplasmic reticulum, or any of the other innumerable vital trappings of normal orthodox biological cells. So that's slipstream four. Now, uh, the first thing that our sci scientists introduced us to was this notion that synthetic biology is the most, is the sort of most latest up-to-date form of hacking biology. But that's been going on since the first recombinant DNA research reported uh, in 1974. So one way to look at synthetic biology is really it's a continuum. It's just the latest sort of and most sophisticated version of something we've been doing for 36 years, would that be? Uh, on the other hand, SynBio has a different mindset it's applying. It is not using the traditional hypothesis-driven method of scientific investigation. It's about making things and making them work in ways we want. Uh, so I made this little comparison. So think about molecular biology, which most of us in do science know, and think about molecular engineering, which is the vision of the SynBio movement. In molecular biology, the goal is to discover. In engineering, it's to design. In molecular biology, one must pay attention to emergent properties. In molecular engineering, they can be a nuisance. What you want is control and prediction. In molecular biology, you want to understand complexity. In molecular engineering, you want to streamline and simplify. Um, if you think about uh, bi science and engineering, uh, biologists have been exposed to ethical debates over their research for at least since Sil uh, Silomar, at least since the mid-70s, if not before. Uh, some engineers are also asked to think about the consequences of the work, but I think it's not as well ingrained in all, all arms of engineering as it is in science. Uh, so the culture training mindset of engineers may be different. 
Uh, and Tom Knight from MIT said this about complexity. Can you guess if he's a scientist or an engineer? Um, I've talked about the benefits. Now, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the possible benefits. For one reason, they're still mostly pretty far off, except for the, the, the sort of intense in genetic engineering that's really much closer to the traditional store work of Kiesling and colleagues. We don't know what will happen with minimal cells and chassis. We don't know what will happen with the biobricks movement. And we certainly don't know what protocells will or will not ever lead to. Nevertheless, the potential positive consequences uh, are mind-boggling. So I'm just going to stipulate that. Now let's talk about the things people worry about. So if you think about synthetic biology and policy, you're going to worry about risks. One of the first risks you worry about is biosecurity, about the possibility that synthetic biology will be used to build new kinds of pathogens that would be used in biological warfare or bioterrorism. Uh, another is the concern about biosafety, uh, which someone dubbed bioerrorism, not me, but it's clever. Uh, and there you're looking at a lot of things. You're looking at the possibility of laboratory accidents, about inadvertent environmental releases, about horizontal gene transfer. Now, I was talking to uh, uh, Nancy Gibbs from Time Magazine about trying to explain this concept of horizontal gene transfer, and I said, well, it's kind of like microbial French kissing. I mean, there's a little, a little exchange of materials there, uh, and, and that happens. That just happens in the natural world. Uh, furthermore, if you design a biological organism, it's not quite like a chemical. The biological organism can evolve and adapt to new environments, at least in theory. Uh, organizations like ETC, the critics, uh, where they uh, call attention to cultural and economic dislocation, and they point out that if you start producing artemisinin in, in vat, industrial vats, those uh, people in the developing world who've been earning money by harvesting wormwood bark aren't going to be able to do that anymore. There won't be a market for it. Um, now, uh, the early analyses of, uh, and the government has been very attentive uh, to issues of biowarfare and bioterrorism. Um, essentially, biowarfare, just by definition, requires state actors, bioterrorism is non-state actors. You can build a number of defenses against both of these. You can build political defenses. Uh, you can try to erect scientific and technological hurdles on top of the ones that exist just generally. Um, one, this is, I actually find comfort in this. Uh, it turns out that making a, bio, making a pathogen is probably not going to be all that tough. People have managed to reassemble the polio virus, reassemble the 1918-19 uh, influenza uh, uh, entity, et cetera. Um, but weaponization of biological uh, agents is very tough. Now, you can imagine scenarios, uh, the, the bio the bioterror equivalent of a suicide bomber who infect, is infected and goes and tries to spread it in, in a you know, public setting. But it turns out to be very, very difficult to do and very difficult to control, probably beyond the, the uh, capacities of non-state actors. Uh, one other source of some comfort, uh, I call this complexity and emergent property, are your friends. Um, this is the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. The current scientific understanding reveals it's often the combination or interaction of genetic elements that underlie properties rather than one specific gene sequence. Again, the biological systems are not simple linear systems. Furthermore, the harmful consequences of biological agents are dependent upon many factors, including host susceptibility, infectivity, transmissibility, and virulence, as well as countermeasures. So, um, there are a number of regulatory frameworks that might be possibly applied to uh, synthetic biology. I just here identify three. One is self-governance. That is, let the people who do SynBio regulate themselves. A second would be government regulation, you know, within an, an intranational regulation, and the third would be international agreements. What about self-governance? Well, we have a little bit of a case study here. The American Society of Microbiology in 2003 uh, had some concerns about the possibility that articles would be published that might in fact 
be dangerous. This is a tif tough thing for scientists to think about. It's tough, it's difficult for scientists to think about any kind of restraint on scientific publication for that sort of reason. But the, the ASM decided to take it, do an experiment. They uh, had 16, somewhere over 16,000 manuscripts received. Uh, all they were reviewed, out of which three were identified as needing special scrutiny. One out of si the 16,000 plus was modified, and all, all those that meant, were meant to be published were published. Now, what's the lesson from here? Uh, some would say, look, it works. Not much dangerous is coming through the system anyway, and we're able to identify it and catch it. Others would say, are you kidding? You modified one article out of 16,000, and you think that's a successful system? So uh, I don't know what the reaction, how to uh, judge this, but that's the example. Now, uh, our f friend Don Kennedy uh, said this about biology becoming big science. It's when the capital cost of the equipment and facilities, oh, what's going on there? Well, you know what? I'll read this to you. Have any of the others been fuzzy like this? OK. Uh, it's when the capital cost of the equipment and special facilities that are needed to support a scientist's research becomes larger than the capital value of the endowment necessary to yield that person's salary. So that was Don's. So he, he was looking at, I'm going to get that off because I'm sure that's true. Oh, no, it's, this one's bad, too. I, uh, if this is a lecture about having complete faith in technology, <laughs> you, you, you have the bottom line. Uh, what Don, Don's point was that um, when the gene, with the genome project, biology became, in a way, big science, at least in, in many laboratories. Uh, but there's been a transition with synthetic biology from big science and to garage biology. Uh, DNA synthesizers can be the size of a microwave to a refrigerator. They can cost under 10 grand or well over 100,000. Uh, and there are more than 20 manufacturers worldwide and more, more every moment. Um, is this all right? Yeah, this one's all right. We went on eBay. You want a DNA synthesizer? I can get you one for under 9,000 bucks. Um, there is a thriving secondary market for DNA synthesizers. If, uh, that's probably beyond the capacity of a lot of garage biologists, but probably not all of them. In any way, the price is going to come down. So what are the options for trying to control, there, we're back. What are the options for trying to control uh, a technology like DNA synthesizers? Well, a number of approaches were considered. You could register them. Uh, you could insist that anyone who operated one had a license. Um, you could try to uh, restrict the supply of necessary raw materials, of spare parts, or of service. These are still, I gather, fairly delicate devices that can break down rather easily. Let's say you did that in whatever pick your pick, whether it's Japan or the United States, there are a lot of other countries in the world. And so the challenge, even if you succeeded with that, if you found the kind of choke point where you could exert regulatory control, you'd still have to achieve international harmonization. Now, um, there are uh, two, two mindsets as to how to go uh, about, th these are rather simplistic ones, but two ways of thinking about how we react to new technologies like synthetic biology, the precautionary principle and what we've called the proactionary principle. Roughly speaking, the precautionary principle, which by the way has far more currency in Europe than in the US, says, look, if you, when you don't really know where it's going to take you, slow down. Um, as I said, the proactionary principle is more like when in doubt, go ahead. Uh, and that, uh, I think, describes the, the mindset of this country much better than the precautionary principle in most cases. Now, uh, the precautionary principle is certainly subject to abuse. You can throw up obstacles for anything. And we're never in a situation where we know every single detail we'd like to know before uh, to be assured that something is 100 percent perfectly safe and incapable of ever being abused or misused. You're never going to get there. So you can't, you know, some radical version of the precautionary principle would essentially grind all technology to a complete halt. 
<clears throat> the proactionary principle also has some potentials for uh, abuse, though, um, which I encountered firsthand. Uh, I'm not sure it's on my bio, Alan, but uh, years ago in my office, I, when I was at the medical school at Case Western, uh, some lawyers called me up and they went, wanted to come visit me. And they, uh, I said, sure, we were, you know, we, we try to be congenial. Uh, and they came and they spent a half an hour describing to me their poor, misunderstood, beleaguered, and entirely virtuous client. They didn't tell me who their client was. After half an hour, they told me who their client was. It was one of America's largest tobacco companies. And at that point, I said, they wanted me to be an expert witness for their client. I said, uh, I can't work for your client, at which point they went into attack mode for about another 45 minutes. Within a year, it didn't happen right away, but within a year, the attorneys general that were then suing the companies, some number of states' attorneys general, also came to me and said, would you be an expert witness on our behalf? So I did that work for over a couple of years. Uh, I only did it to the point where we got the point of principle, where the, the tobacco industry said, we acknowledge our product kills people. At that point, I bowed out of it. Um, and then it was about the money. Um, and I was interested in the, more in the principle. Uh, but in the course of reading tens of thousands of pages of uh, industry documents in preparation for my nine to ten days of deposition, ever been deposed? I, I, it's, uh, how, best description I have is, imagine you were a hockey goalie, except you have no equipment, no face mask, no gloves, and in fact you have no teammates in front of you. <laughs> And you spend the entire time, and they're just flipping that puck at you, and you're trying to dodge it and, and not get hurt. But that was what a day of deposition is like. And multiply that by nine or ten, and you know what my experience was. Um, one of the classic documents is uh, that uh, I think it was an industry lawyer who said, look, our product is doubt. And doubt, like cigarettes, can be manufactured. And they, they had a very sophisticated way of recruiting scientists. First of all, they'd feel them out without letting them know they were tobacco. Uh, if they found the right kind of attitudes and sensibilities, they would then say who they were. At that point, some of the scientists would say, I, you know, I can't be involved with you. But others would say, well, you know, I believe that. I'm willing to testify for that. So even if you had 20,000 scientists, all of whom were utterly convinced about the, you know, the dangers of tobacco smoking, and you had 10 scientists, or eight scientists, who were willing to stand up in public settings and say, well, we think there's still doubt. That's all you needed. If you're an industry as clever and well-heeled as tobacco, that's all you needed. So that's why I, I say the proactionary principle has its own it, uh, matter, because as long as you can say, we don't know that it's harmful, as long as you can manufacture some doubt about the disadvantages of something, you can keep, you can keep the policymakers off your back. Uh, I can't. In work I did in the early 1980s on the regulation of asbestos, ethics and values in the regulation of asbestos, uh, I read the entire hearing, uh, hearing record for that was the first substance that the Occupational Health and Safety Administration had a full rulemaking procedure for. And I read the hearing and I recognized, came to recognize that the debate in the hearing was over who, on whose shoulders rested the burden of uncertainty. Industry advocates said it's on the burden of the public health folks who want us to, to, not exp to lower exposures. Public health folks said, no, it ought to be an industry. You shouldn't be exposing people to something that might be dangerous. Um, and that was, a, that was a study we did, I said, in the early 80s. Now, now I'm going to, uh, this is, uh, how shall I describe what I'm about to do? Uh, I'm trying to think in ways that aren't stale about issues like synthetic biology. Uh, and it, occurs to, it occurred to me that uh, uh, there are different ways of approaching certain kinds of conflicts over issues in ethics and science. Now, some person who must have been very wise once said that there are two kinds of people in the world. People who think the world can be divided into two kinds of people and people who don't. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to argue here that there are at least two kinds of conflicts over si ethics, science, and values in the world. There probably are many more, but uh, I'm going to give you a particular sort of framework to think about that general problem and then try to apply it to SynBio. 
So you look back on uh, in, uh, the new president uh, in 2009, uh, and embryonic stem cell research, as you know, had been before then limited to uh, about a, less than two dozen lines, effectively, that had been created before the President Bush had made his uh, statement in uh, August of uh, 2001. Uh, shortly after assuming office, President Obama reversed that decision, but as you know, that's been in court, uh, and uh, we're back and forth, and we don't know where it will come out. Compare a reaction in the U.S., where this is a very fraught, difficult debate, with how the same issues have played out in the UK. Well, since 1990, researchers can use leftover embryos for research. You can even create embryos for research if you can get the approval of the HFEA. Um, a new interpretation of the law in 2001 said that you could do it not just for reproductive research, but you could do it for basic research. Furthermore, a, they're even considering allowing uh, Somatic, somatic cell nuclear transfer, clone, what we call cloning. Um, and it just hasn't had anywhere near the heat of the battle that it's had in the U.S. On the other hand, if you look at GMOs, in the U.K. and the European Union more broadly, they've imposed a very rigorous approval project on GMOs, a process. Uh, you have to prove that a genetically modified trait is as safe as a comparable conventional product. This seems to me to be a fairly straightforward uh, application of the precautionary principle. And you have to test for unforeseen changes in plant metabolism if you tinker with genes. So, pretty strong, heavy burden on the shoulders of anyone who would wish to in, uh, introduce such a crop. In the U.S., GMOs are, just fall under the regular FDA rule, and there is G the FDA's position is we give no unique consideration for GM products. So I don't know if that's the proactionary principle, but it seems a lot closer. So here's, here's the way I want you to, th I'm going to suggest you can think about debates. In terms of interests or identities. So look at, uh, that's, a, that's a Chrysler, I'm not sure the model, some, uh, 300, it's the Chrysler 300. You remember the, the contentious debate over the Chrysler restructuring. Uh, uh, stockholders were fighting with bondholders, with fighting, were fighting with uh, uh, the suppliers who Chrysler owed money to, were supplying to other holders of debt, or were fighting with other holders of debt and fighting with workers, working with active workers, fighting with retired workers. You had all these parties engaged in a fierce dispute over who was going to get what out of this restructuring. Then, uh, you know, the, uh, the third rail of uh, American politics and American bioethics is abortion. And here I'm going back to a book, uh, I think it's a wonderful book, Kristen Luker's book on abortion and the politics of motherhood. And Luker wrote this round, and she's writing about the abortion debate post Roe v. Wade. When things changed, prior to Roe v. Wade, there was an anti-abortion movement in the United States, but it was relatively small and it was largely dominated by men. The big difference after Roe v. Wade was a large number of women going into the, uh, where they would say pro-life, uh, others would say anti-abortion movement. It mobilized large numbers of women. Uh, and Luca wrote, this round of the abortion debate is so passionate and hard fought, fought because it is a referendum on the place and meaning of motherhood. Now, back to Chrysler, right? Each of the parties that were fighting had interests, and basically monetary interests. Um, but when you have a fight over interests, you can make trade-offs. You can achieve a genuine compromise. In fact, one where no one feels violated. You may be disgruntled and wish you'd gotten more, but you could say, well, you know, it's as, it's as good as we could do under the circumstances. Furthermore, you can represent public interests as long with private and commercial interests, for example, the commons if it's a debate, if it's a dispute over some, uh, you know, development or other environmentally relevant thing. Now, identities, debates about identities, I think, are different. Um, debates over identities, like the abortion debate in this country, I believe are debates over core beliefs about one's place in the world and the possibilities for human flourishing. 
If you compromise in a, a debate that's really more of an identity than an interest debate, the compromise is only tactical and temporary. That is, I can't get any more right now, but I'm coming back at you. Uh, and identities themselves must either prevail or evolve. They cannot be compromised. Um, I say evolve because uh, when I wrote, published The Worth of a Child almost 15 years ago, I hypothesized that there might be some change in the tenor of the abortion debate, given the fact that many more women, uh, including women who, would have, uh, who identify themselves as uh, pro-life, uh, were in now two worker families. And the key point for women in the pro-choice movement was that uncontrolled fertility was the single greatest threat to a woman's opportunity to have a reasonable job, have a career and a job. And so that was, that was largely what, that was the center of their objections. And I wondered if as more women who might otherwise be inclined to be pro-life had, had to get jobs and looked around and realized that maybe they weren't getting paid the same as men, whether that might change their views. I have, I can, that was one prediction I offered that has not come true, or at least I don't see the evidence for it. Roe v. Wade led to the rise of this any abortion women group that called themselves the mothers. This is not my title. Advocates, it turns out, on the two sides of the debate, they didn't just differ on their beliefs about abortion. They had very different views about what it was to be a man and what it was to be a woman and what it was to have a good life as a man and what it was uh, like to have a good life as a woman. Uh, I refer to this as the separate or shared past. If you are people in the pro-life movement, we're far more likely to sort of see women's lives and men's lives as being maybe on parallel paths but separate paths. People on the pro-choice side tended to see, if not an identity, at least a strong overlap between the two. I mean, um, yes. And about the place of motherhood in women's lives. Now, what you get in those in identity debates, disputes, is what I'll call mutual unintelligibility. I think I'm borrowing this from Alistair McIntyre. Essentially, it's a reaction of when you hear what the others are saying, how could anybody think that? And I suspect that characterizes a large number of splits, in, certainly in this country, and I suspect elsewhere as well. Uh, and when that is the sort of underlying belief about your opponent, how could anybody think that? It makes dialogue and compromise very difficult. Now, in practice, I'd interest align with identities. So it turned out that there were differences in education, background, work experience, and job qualifications between activists on the two sides. Uh, which inspires the question whether people fashion their identities according to their interests or do their interests take shape according to their identities? Don't know the answer. How does this all relate to synthetic biology? Well, we, at this point we don't know how many of the potential tensions, social tensions, ethical tensions over SynBio are going to be debates about interests. Those we can, we know how to solve those. Um, it can be painful, but we know how to deal with them. Or are they going to be di disputes over identities? We don't know the answer. Nor do we know the answer to this question, whether the, this tension between the pre precautionary and proactionary principles reflect interests or also identities. Now, if you cash out the two principles just in terms of risks and benefits and say, well, uh, the people on the precautionary principle, they, they, they pay more attention to risk, less to benefit. So they rate risks they give more weight to risk, and the inverse for the proactionary. But it might be that people who subscribe to the precautionary principle also think of themselves as, well, we're just sort of the sort of people who think risk-taking is a good thing. So that begins to look more like an identity. Okay? Or the, pro the proactionary folks might say, we think innovation you know, is, is a vital part of who we are. And one hears that about this country a lot. So it might be also about identity. Uh, another question we, we, uh, that nothing has to be taken on is, is bio best understood as really on this continuum with decades of hacking biology that began with Cohen and Boyer? Or is it different in fundamental ways? Um, I have to say, when a congressional committee, st when congressional committee staff called us after the uh, vendor's paper announcing the synthetic cell uh, to, and ultimately my colleague testified, um, we mentioned this 
term hacking biology, and there was this silence on the other end of the phone. They said, please don't use that phrase when you testify. <laughs> to members of Congress, hacking is always a bad thing. Um, it's, it's not to the scientists who use it in this case. So, if, of course, if you accept the continuum account that it's really just in a way more of the same, uh, then should we re-examine certain practices in genetic engineering? Because that's really, that's an implication of it. If you have concerns about Symbio, and Symbio is pretty much just like this, well, maybe you need to think about this. Uh, and the last point is that synth in the minds of some, synthetic biology has implications for our relationship with nature and the natural, and with our humankind's role as manipulator and potentially creator of a sort of life. Now, uh, one of the other uh, groups doing research is the Woodrow Wilson International Center uh, on Symbio. Um, and they took a public survey. This is the recent, most recent survey. So you'll notice that uh, environmental damage is a very small worry. About 4% of respondents thought that was a concern. Health effects for people, that's up in the low 20s. Um, biological weapons is, you know, tips about 27%. But here's the, here's the key one. Is it morally wrong to create artificial life? A quarter of American respondents said yes, it is. Now, I would love, as an ethicist, to know why they thought that was morally wrong. Can you cash that out in terms of consequences? Is it morally wrong because we'll make mistakes and we'll hurt people? Or is it just something we shouldn't do? I'd love to know what they think um, about that. Uh, further, day two, two of this, one more slide from the survey after this one. So when you ask people to give you their impression of risks and benefits of synthetic biology, first thing, by the way, is not many people have heard of it. <laughs> So uh, p people are quite willing to give you a response to a question about something they know nothing about. Um, so you see, uh, so at least almost a third say we're not sure. Look, focus on risks will outweigh benefits. Only 16% think that's the case. Third think it's going to be equal. 19% say benefits will outweigh risks. So then what the surveyors did was they gave people a description of what synthetic biology actually is. And they asked them the same question. And uh, this slide coming up, despite my best efforts to make it look right, is, a, is another piece of evidence why we should never have complete faith in technology, because I just can't make this. It's an oval, not a circle, and I have no idea how to fix that. Um, all of a sudden, the not sure went down. But look, remember how many said risk will outweigh benefits before? It was 16%. You te teach people more about it, and now it's a third of the respondents. So, um, is ignorance bliss? I'm not sure, but clearly there's a lot to be done in helping the, first of all, helping the public understand what synthetic biology is, and then attending to what people are saying about synthetic biology, and understanding what its significance is, and how the scientific community can appropriately re and respectfully respond to that. Um, uh, two German scholars, uh, Bolton Mueller, uh, they've written that synthetic biology changes the human role in the cosmos. And whenever you want to sound profound, you use Latin, I've discovered. Uh, from um, manipulatio to creatio ex assistendo. And they argue that that's a fundamentally altered relationship to nature and that's something to worry about. Uh, now, there are two ways to take that. One is that this inappropriately elevates humans, a kind of hubris argument. The second is it inappropriately degrades nature. It doesn't give nature the respect nature would be due independently of our own stature. That's my colleague, Greg. Now, to me, this may be a great disagreement over identities, over what the human relationship to nature means for us as a species. Uh, and we have a lot of work to do yet. Um, now, one set of concerns, there are at least two different kinds of concerns. One set is about risks and benefits. Now, those are serious, serious concerns. Again, if I didn't think that the potential benefits, most of them are going to be pretty far down the road, were massive, it wouldn't, there'd be no point in having this conversation. We should just not do it. But I think that's, those are plausible scenarios. Um, the risks uh, are, uh, on the one hand, some of them are rather sort of 
obvious and simple, but some of them are a little, uh, require a little more thought. Uh, a scientist that my colleague Greg Hadnick was talking to said, well, he thinks synthetic biology is just great, he's really excited about it, and the only thing that worries him is the possibility of catastrophe. <laughs> and this was said without irony. Um, so how do we think about catastrophe, about the possibility of catastrophe? How do we think about uh, events of probably very, very low probability, but not zero probability, uh, with a very large error bar around the likelihood of it happening, uh, but with potentially massive negative consequences. How do we think about those? So one thing we would like to do at the Hastings Center is dig more deeply into the kinds of tools that people use in risk assessment, and in particular into the philosophical and ethical foundations of the ways we think about these kinds of uh, un, you know, uncommon but uh, essentially unknowable uh, in advance risks. So that's one thing. Risks and benefits also are, by the way, an easy sort of easy thing for policymakers and the public to get their hands around. They can, we're used to talking about risks and benefits. The, the second uh, kind of objection is a little harder. Uh, it, these are objections based on what we can call intrinsic concerns. There are other labels but essentially a concern you have that you can't simply reduce the consequences. You can't cash it all out just in terms of risks and benefits. Wilderness preservation looks to be one of those kinds of, of uh, values. Some people say, well, the reason you preserve wilderness is so that people can go and experience it. But then you have to say, well, so why is having the experience of wilderness a humanly valuable thing in the first place? There's something about a wilderness that you know, isn't easily reduced to risks and benefits. Uh, species uh, preservation, I think, has a similar kind of resonance. Um, you can make, uh, philosophers would call it a consequentialist argument about it, but you can also make one about intrinsic concerns. Now, uh, I'm paraphrasing Craig Venner here when he said, of this new thing, one parent is a computer. Um, I didn't know that bacteria had two parents, but one parent is a computer. Um, that's, that is a way of thinking about it, and some have interpreted the creation of the so-called synthetic cell as a, a, a fundamental uh, rebuttal of any notion of vitalism or any, any religious idea about the specialness of life um, or sacredness of life. Well, I mean, I'm not defending any particular view here. I'm trying to describe uh, what we see. When you restrict synthetic biology to tinkering with microbes, even creating synthetic genomes, um, does this somehow undermine the idea that some will have, maybe it's a matter of their religious faith, that life is something special, that there is a divine spark in life? I'm not a theologian, but what we have come to understand is that any reasonably sophisticated philosophical or theological system can easily deal with the synthetic genome. Uh, it just doesn't follow that you can, that life loses its specialness just because we can make it, we can write a genome on a computer. Now, when we get to humans and the application of synthetic biology to humans, which, again, far off, I think, that may be another story. And this is my last content slide. Um, so uh, Pete Warden is apparently the director of the NASA Ames Center. And he said this quite recently, that he said, in settling on other worlds, we need to be cautious. How do you live in another world? I don't have the slightest idea. If you're a conservative, you worry about it killing us. If you're a liberal, you worry about us killing it. <laughs> I think things like synthetic biology have a lot of potential for that. I think rather than make an environment on Mars like Earth, why don't we modify life, including the human genome, so that it's better suited to Mars? So that is one potential future use of synthetic biology. By the way, Worden also said that that's what the whole space program, he said that's the focus of the space program now, is colonization of other, other bodies. Um, these are my colleagues at the Hastings Center who work with me on this project. Uh, Mary Crowley is actually here. And that's the Hastings Center. If you stand with your back to that door uh, and look the other way, you will be looking out across the, one of the most beautiful vistas of the Hudson River. Uh, and uh, I do urge any and all of you to come visit us someday. We love having visitors 
We'll make you talk at lunch is the one thing. We'll give, you, we'll give you a sandwich, but we'll ask you to sing for your lunch. Thank you very much. That was terrific. I loved it. Um, the floor will be open for questions. I, we do ask that you use the microphones, that you say who you are, and then the rule. The rule is try to remember a question ends with your voice going up, right? It's usually brief. It is not a monotribe. He's the speaker, you're the questioner. So please, if you don't mind, use the microphone, identify yourself. Uh, okay, and I'm gonna let Tom moderate. Hi, uh, my name is Wes McDermott, and uh, as a working biologist, it seems clear to me that it is a continuum. So I'm, in terms of previous genetic engineering to SynBio, at least in most of your definitions. So I'm curious to hear what the argument is for this being something totally new. Uh, sort of a question. Well, stay at the mic, would you please, Wes? Um, uh, so I'm, I'm in your camp, I think. But I think what has changed is uh, a new set of professionals, that is from coming from engineering rather than from molecular biology, with a very different mindset and very different program and goals. Um, so that is a change. Now whether that will have any morally great moral consequences, I think we're, the jury's out on that. Um, and does, that, does that strike you as yeah, No, no, and that yeah. certainly seems uh, consistent with some of the quotes you had. Yeah, uh, and some of the people involved. So, yeah. so I think I think it's sort of a mindset and approach, and a different set of professional norms and backgrounds coming into it. And that's you know uh, we should pay attention to that. Is all I can say. Thank you. Good. I'll ask a question. So, where are religious leaders coming down on the, this question? I think that at least I had never thought about this continuum question before. Is this just a little bit more genetic? I, engineering or recombinants or cottage cheese, but, but it's possible that, that uh, various religions who have different views of the nature of life or whatever might have different views. Some issues about the sacredness of life have to do with religion. Do you have any experience with that? Yeah. Uh, I have relevant experience and, and uh, some specific uh, comments on SynBio. So the relevant experience is when I was a member of the President's Bioethics Commission when Dolly's birth was announced. Remember Dolly? 1997, as I recall. And we had been a kind of sleepy uh, commission that the White House was giving effectively no support to, uh, after having created it uh, at the behest of Congress, we learned, um, or were told. Uh, and then Dolly was born, and somebody said, okay, what are we going to do about cloning? And somebody, you got a bioethics commission. Let them deal with it. <laughs> so I get this fax, along with the other commissioners, giving us 90 days to uh, provide recommendations about human cloning. Uh, easy, you know, uh, easy job. Now, one thing I think that was, we did that was very smart was we invited in, at the very first meeting, formal meeting, uh, hearing, religious leaders to tell us what they thought about human cloning, what the, their various traditions. And we invited in four traditions. Uh, those were the innocent days. Uh, uh, Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, Judaism, and Islam. And we had just one Islamicist, but we had th two of each of the other three traditions, and systematically chosen from the relatively liberal and the relatively conservative wings. Now, uh, two comments about that exercise. One was they had a lot of interesting stuff to say. They're very smart people. Um, they um, it won't, may not surprise you to know that the views had more to do with whether they were on the liberal or conservative end than what their particular tradition was. So the liberal, Catholic, Protestant, and Jew had more in common with each other than either any of them have with the conservative, Catholic, Protestant, or Jew. Very interesting. One very prominent theologian, someone I'm actually quite fond of personally, was asked, did he think that a clone would have a soul? And he paused, reflected, and he said no. He changed his mind later. 
about that. Uh, but I think he was right to change his mind. I think now getting to Sunbio. Uh, from what I understand, the efforts to get religious leaders to sort of chime in on this is no one sees a problem with screwing around with a microbe at this point. None of the traditions that we're aware of have raised any, any fuss about it. It will only be as we get further up the phylogenetic chain, and particularly if we get to humans, that I think we'll, we're going to hear we're going to hear complaints. Hi, my name is Chris Hoffman. I'm a AAAS fellow. I was curious about your splitting the interests and identities, and whether interests can become identities and identities interests. How do you think that might happen? So I was thinking about your GM example, and you talked about the interests of GM, but then I also think that, for example, people may have a very fundamental belief in the role of government, and government should or shouldn't play a role in you know, the ec economy. And so it seems like that issue, you could engage people in the identity side by talking about interests. Um, and I wasn't sure if all issues sort of can, can be converted, and if, if, is that a good way to start to? Um, uh, well, thank you. That's a terrific uh, question. Uh, the way I set it up over the, the breakup of Chrysler, uh, that was all interest, right? Because the government wasn't an actor in that. That was the various people who had a financial stake in Chrysler as it existed. It was a private company. So that was interest, in my view. Uh, I think you're right that some people might object to certain kinds of government action based on deep ideological convictions about the rightful place and the wrongful place of government action. And they might, that might actually become like an identity conflict. Uh, uh, and so it would make it even harder to resolve. My, my basic point is, to the extent that conflicts are structured as identity conflicts, they're much tougher to deal with, much tougher to resolve, without some change, without some evolution or adaptation of the identities than with a straightforward interest conflict. Now, it is possible for people to, some people to object to something out of interest, and other people to object to exactly the same thing out of identities. So there's not a conflict there, not, not, a, not a logical conflict. But thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you for a very interesting talk. My name is Fanley Chow. I'm a former AAAS fellow, now working for the Department of Agriculture. And in a lot of your slides, you kind of mentioned this, um, how folks think about our interaction with nature when they think about SEMBIO. So I think SEMBIO is, is a continuum of genetic engineering and genetic modification, but our relationship with nature is also kind of an evolving and continuum as well. And depending on folks, how folks define our interaction with nature, it will kind of I would think that discussion would apply not just to synthetic biology, but also to genetic engineering as well. So can you speak how, like, in our past um, discussions about our interaction with nature in these topics are more acceptable genetic modifications to how can, we can use that in talking about synthetic biology? Uh, <clears throat> to the extent that you uh, accept the continuum account that these four streams of symbio are uh, in their, each in their own way kind of connected uh, to earlier ways of hacking biology. Um, you can probably also uh, see a kind of continuum account of how we think about nature that might map parallel, go along parallel to that, that debate. Um, Uh, I don't have any great wisdom to impart about our relationship with nature. I can tell you that my colleague, Greg Kabnick, has a book uh, coming out on exactly this, uh, this matter uh, that I, will, I think will offer some enlightenment. But uh, one thing I can say is that um, there is a tendency in American intellectual life to, uh, uh, to show a lack of respect for arguments that aren't framed in terms of consequences, in terms of risks and benefits. That's a mistake. Well, it's a mistake for two ways. It's a mistake because lots of people, in fact, probably everybody in this room holds beliefs that if you dig deep enough, you'll recognize they aren't going to be dislodged uh, because of risks and benefits, that they have to do with 
what really matters to us, right? So number one, people have those beliefs. And number two, it is possible, it may require work because our language and policy language in particular is not readily acclimated to these kinds of intrinsic concerns, but it's worth the, worth the job of trying to articulate them well. And I think it is the responsibility of all of us as citizens to take those concerns that we think, those intrinsic concerns that we think are most important and uh, least understood and try to articulate them and get them out in the, in the public discourse, including concerns about nature. Yes. Gerald Epstein, I work at, at AAAS. I guess my question gets back to the identities and interests. It seems clear that some of the critics of synthetic biology really have much deeper problems with much bigger issues. They don't like globalization, they don't like corporations, they don't like yeah. income inequities. Yeah. And everything else in the world is sort of too, too far gone to do anything about it. But synthetic biology is kind of the innocent bystander they can whack and solve these other problems. And uh, I guess I'm demeaning the point of view, but is that sort of a legitimate approach? We've got a big problem, and here's the one I can take it out on, as opposed to anything intrinsic to synthetic biology. It's sort of a proxy for, for a much bigger issue. Well, synthetic biology as innocent bystander is a new concept. I mean, I had, I had never, uh, uh, I hadn't, I don't think you actually asked a question, but I thought you made a very, I thought you made a great, a great observation, so thank you for it, yeah. And I think you're probably significantly correct on that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, Thomas Doggett, I'm AAAS. Um, when you're listing the applications, there's one thing I noticed that I had read about, but you hadn't mentioned about basically synthetic biology for geoengineering, like engineering some kind of carbon some stuff that would eat the carbon out of the atmosphere. And I guess that's a whole other issue about geoengineering, but how feasible do you think that is, or is that just the hype of you know, these false hopes of how we can solve global warming without actually mending our ways? So does everyone know what geoengineering is? I mean, it's the idea that one would make massive interventions in the uh, environment, you know, put up shields in the atmosphere. They could be aerosols or something else. Yeah. To, like as a way of deflecting some of geoengineering with Pardon? this is the idea of, so, of, a, of a softer version of geoengineering with, with synthetic biology, and I guess my question is why is, is it that, softer? Well, just by by having by by using cute little microbes instead, instead of, of yeah. you know big yeah. industrial what yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm, my question is more about you. you I had seen that listed as an application, and you didn't mention it. I'm I wondering, do you think it's hype or is it one of the possible? Um, Possible benefits. Uh, no, I, I think, you know, thank you for mentioning it. You're right, I, I, I didn't. Uh, we hadn't focused much attention on it. Uh, but I think it actually it warrants some significant attention. I mean, there are views about, uh, I mean, I did just recently read a proposal that synthetic biology ought to be applied to architecture. So that you would create building materials that would, for example, absorb carbon dioxide. You build houses out of something that would actually suck up carbon dioxide. Uh, or suck up, uh, uh, suck up toxins, uh, and that would, at you know, the appropriate time, essentially degrade into harmless. The, the whole building would essentially, you know, become a harmless, a harmless puddle of something. I'm not sure what it is, but so and that that was, you know, I think that's a proposal that's sort of as far-reaching and out there as the geoengineering proposals. Geoengineering has a. Um, Of, of all the things that we would worry about in terms of uh, massive consequences, including unintended consequences, geoengineering certainly holds the promise along with some you know, widespread environmental releases, let's say, of, uh, of synthetically created microbes, of massive changes, including the possibility, as that one scientist said, of catastrophe. I'm not saying we shouldn't consider it. We should. But we need better ways of getting our hands around the risks and making and an evaluation of those risks. Thanks. So I'm still Alan Leshner. I thought I should use this microphone if I had a question. Um, so we've been talking mostly about synthetic biology as syn synthetic whole organisms. But there's a continuum where we're making synthetic body parts. And I think most people would say, well, a synthetic thumb. Let's see. If you can make that work, that would be pretty cool. But what happens when you get to a synthetic brain? Because, unless I'm mistaken, as a neuroscientist, the brain is where we keep your mind. 
And it may be that that's where we keep your soul, whatever that is. And uh, is there discussion in the synthetic biology ethics community about sort of different pieces in the continuum, so to speak? That is, from creating whole organisms down to pieces of organisms and then different kinds of pieces of organisms. Uh, I, the answer, I think, is yes. Um, one of the topics I debated with a colleague when I first came to the Hastings Center about 1979, Art and I were talking about, uh, we had the simultaneous brain transplant. Who consents to what? That was our ethical. That's a joke, folks. That's a joke. <laughs> uh, that was, so, I mean, what sense do we make of efforts to, and I know you are a neuroscientist now, what efforts to systematically manipulate the brain. Well, we do that all the time. We do it with pharmaceuticals. And we worry about that. And we worry about that. And sometimes we do it with other kinds of interventions. Uh, the uh, treatments for Parkinson's, is it, that use sort of deep stimulation for Parkinson's. Uh, when it comes to that organ, I mean, it's, for most people, it's, you know, it's among the top, it's in the top three organs of the body, favorite organs of the body. Um, <laughs> when you, uh, when you tinker with that organ, that does seem to be more the site of our identity, uh, in that sense, than, than the others. I mean, heart transplant carries, and it turns, actually, it turns out to carry some pretty powerful emotional weight uh, for people. Uh, it may be an irrational reaction, but it's quite common to find that. Uh, but brain transplant, uh-uh. I mean, even if we could do it, I think people don't welcome that. So this would be a nice collaboration between the frontiers of neuroscience and the frontiers of synthetic biology. It'd be fun. Yes. Hi, my name's Lance Miller. I'm with the Federation of American Scientists. I was wondering when you were talking about the survey of did people believe whether the risks or the outweigh the benefits of some of the uh, SynBio, and after explaining sort of what synthetic biology was, you saw an almost doubling of the uh, risks outweighing the benefits. Do you know, was it the unsure that went totally skewed toward yeah. uh, the risk side, or I was wondering if there was any shuffling going around? The, un the, the unsure divided, but more went to the risks outweigh benefits than benefits outweigh risk side. A lot of, many fewer people were unsure. Um, you can find the full report of the survey on the Woodrow Wilson Institutes. They probably have it on the website. I haven't looked recently, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of how it played out. Thank you. I wanted to just ask you about sorry. your... Uh, sorry, I'm Peter Utro from the Environmental Protection Agency. And I had uh, a question that has nothing to do with my being from the Environmental Protection Agency. The continuum that you postulated or that uh, you reflected upon, I was wondering if you yourself believe that there are things that simply cannot fall on that continuum. It was hyperbolic, I suspect, when you mentioned it, but you talked about the uh, silicon-based life forms as first brought up in Star Trek. Is that, in fact, something so different as to not belong on the continuum and require a different analytic? Well, that was, a, that was a deep question. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pick up with something that Alan used as a preface. Uh, it, it, it is very much in the mindset of the people, some of the people involved in synthetic biology, that they're not creating organisms. They're creating biological subsystems that do certain things. I mean, the biobricks movement, you don't necessarily need to have a whole microbe. You might be able to get by with a kind of soup where your construct is in there and it's doing the stuff in that soup that you want it to do. Okay, so, Alan, was, your premise was correct, and that is a part of the design. And that is, in fact, also part of the proto-life, the conception of the proto-life movement. They're not sure whether you need a cell membrane. They're not sure whether replication is really required. In fact, in some ways, it'd be better if you could create a system that didn't replicate, because then a lot of the worries that you have go away. Um, that said, uh, the, the 
tentative conclusion that my colleagues and I have reached about synthetic biology is that there's nothing so new or so distinctive about synthetic biology, even the proto-life movement, that we that completely escape our tools for ethical analysis or public policy. I mean, in the end, if you wanted to screw around with human brains using synthetic biology, we kind of know the worries that you ought to have about that. And the fact that you're doing it with synthetic biology rather than drugs or whatever else is not in and of itself interesting. What's interesting, it doesn't make it different. I mean, if it's a self-replicating thing that could actually take over your brain, well, that, then that makes it different. But that's what makes it different, not the fact that it's synthetic biology. Is that making sense? Well, maybe it isn't, but that's the best answer I can give. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you again, for, uh, thank you again for a wonderfully interesting and provocative talk. Thank you again to our colleagues from Hitachi. Thank you. Thank you.